Here's an idea. Video games have a chance to become the next spectator sport. Even if you don't paint your chest and face and hold up one of those adorable D with the fence signs, there is a rather good chance that you have, at some point, watched sports. It's okay, your nerd cred is still intact. Ray, he's kicked the ball. Your nerd cred is especially intact, though, if you've painted your chest and face and held up a defense sign not at a football or football game, but at a StarCraft match. Competitive gaming is exactly what it sounds like. People who are very good at video games like StarCraft, League of Legends, Call of Duty, Street Fighter, compete professionally for glory and money. Otherwise known as eSports, competitive gaming is popular nationwide in South Korea. It's growing in popularity in Europe and good old America, meaning that while the audience for competitive gaming is smaller than, say, the Super Bowl, it is by no means small. 4.7 million people tuned into last year's Major League Gaming Spring Championship, 6 million to IGN's IPL5. For comparison, that is 2 million more viewers than Game 2 of the Stanley Cup Finals, but about 10 million less than Game 5 of the NBA Finals. The Super Bowl got about 108 million viewers, and the 2010 World Cup got about, drum roll please, 3.2 billion viewers. So while it might be a while before Dota 2 is capturing half of the world's eyeballs, we can't help but wonder what it's going to take to make a video game the next big spectator sport. I mean, when we think of sports and why we'd spectate, it's a very particular set of activities that comes to mind. Feats of dexterity, strength, and athleticism. It's about putting the ball or the puck or your body in the right place at the right time. It is about winning. But really? How much of any sport is wholly and completely about who is factually and actually the best at it? People aren't invested in the rivalry between the Boston Red Sox and the New York Yankees because they are two very evenly skill-matched groups of millionaires in different colored clothing. Professional sports is about personal histories and backgrounds. It's debates about who is the greatest. It's the hero's journey and who deserves to be a champion. The boss. When all of this stuff is paired with the unpredictable action of the sporting event itself, a narrative emerges. And the athletes become just as much characters and performers as they do practitioners of some very impressive task. Professional sports is fundamentally about story. The thrill of victory and the agony of defeat is just as true in the wide world of sports as it is for Shakespeare's Henry VIII or High School Musical. So, of course, the infrastructure we build around sporting events, the television networks, the flying cameras, the commentators, advertisements, and merchandise, all exists to support that story. It is not simply about who is a better athlete or wins more games. I mean, ask any Cubs or Liverpool fan. See? It's not just about the game. Rivalries drive narratives. Camera angles and close-ups of players' faces let us speculate about how they're feeling. Commentators let us know what they must be thinking. Daddy, stay on your bike! On-screen overlays elucidate the mechanics and report the state of the game so everybody can focus on what's important, the narrative. Competitive gaming, by comparison, lacks most, if not, all of this. Not the story, of course. You can't have competitive anything, not even curling or cake making, without a good story. But you can lack the infrastructure which supports and reinforces it for a wide audience. As Jason Johnson points out in his Kill Screen article, link in the description, most games played competitively are made for one person. He points out that if you had to watch American football video game style from the helmet cam of a single player, you'd have no idea what was going on. And you'd probably bomb. Additionally, there's no video game version of the NFL's crowd-pleasing bright yellow first downline, or multi-camera slow-mo instant replays to outline or review goals and objectives. There are no globally collected and shared stats for all of the esports players in the many leagues upon leagues upon leagues. And easily comparable stats are the fundamental building blocks of character and narrative in the sports world. Ask any commentator or announcer. Plus, the nature of video games means they're always being changed and updated. This puts a ton of stress on the announcers. We don't need the Brent Musburger or John Madden a video game commentary detailing every practical action, we need them spinning an amazing yarn so that I know why I should love or hate Flash. We need all of these down and dirty, sporty nuts and bolts so that we can organize the facts and know who is who. The underdog, the long shot, the villain. Who do I root for? Just tell me. Because until gamers start dressing and acting like wrestlers, wearing their characters literally on their sleeves, we need insight. Great stories need great characters. Counter-Strike needs its Tiger Woods. Street Fighter, its Mike Tyson. Call of Duty needs its Lance Armstrong. 
sort of. It is around the cult of personality that so many people are invited into sports and then left to consider what is truly riveting about the game itself. We need to know Justin Wong's history before we can understand just how inspired his ponage really is. Also, we have to know that he's one of the best so that we can root for the underdog. It also might be helpful to know whether or not he's a jerk in real life, or goes around saving puppies. Once the technology coalesces to decrypt these incredibly new and mercurial games, allowing us to consume stories full of characters that we're interested in, I think it's safe to say that in more places than just South Korea and Sweden, a video game could become a major league sport. Or at least a more engaging Olympic event than long distance swimming. 25, athletes swim six laps of a course marked out by boys. Huh? What do you guys think? Will a video game become the next big spectator sport? Let us know in the comments. And Idea Channel doesn't run on pylons, it runs on subscriber lawns. That really didn't work out. I'm not gonna go comments, because that would be too easy. Let's see what you guys had to say about our love of zombies. Okay, first, before comments, some links. Um, there's a really great conversation about our maths episode um, on Boing Boing. We'll put a link to that in the description. And speaking of math versus maths, uh, Brady at Number File made a math versus maths video, which is awesome. And a bunch of people also pointed us towards the extra credits video on zombies, which is great. And you should watch that as well. So much watching for you to do. Two Crossy28 and other people saying that The Last of Us and 28 Days Later um, are not actually zombie properties. I think the threats in those things are basically indistinguishable from zombies, so regardless of what they're called in the universe, to me at least, they're zombies. 14 Bomb is really sick of Zamboogles, whatever those are. But to everyone else who is sick of zombies, it's yet another indication that the fat is dying out and we should pick something else to be terrified of pretty soon. I think, um, first of all, I don't know if that's, I don't know if that's true, but second of all, I think that you don't necessarily actually have to be afraid of the thing in order to fully buy into the fear element of it. Um, and that I think the representation can be strong, even if it's not literally effective. LMA Sargent attributes the popularity of zombies to the fact that they are a humanoid monster that you don't have to feel bad about killing, and so you can then kind of pretend like you're killing your coworker or something, which is a little bleak and dark, but maybe has some truth to it. To Spain David 1125 at first I was like, ha! But then I was like, hmm. Relatedly, Urban Sound points to the Day of the Triffids, which if you haven't read, you should. It's about killer plants, basically. Enrique Ayala points out that technology was actually the solution to the Z problem in World War Z. I haven't seen it, but I would guess maybe it's like, uh, is it possible that it is a cause of and solution to kind of thing? I don't know. Chmis3 says that they think the next monster will be maybe some sort of mind-controlling being uh, because of our fear of surveillance or the destruction of personal autonomy. Um, yeah, I'm on board for that. That sounds terrifying. I would also say Beholder would be an absolutely just horrifying monster. Not sure if you're serious, but Uwe, sorry for mispronouncing your name. Graham Russell says that he could see Slenderman being one of the next big mainstream baddies, which I agree, and also kind of related to um, Cthulhu because he's this sort of unknowable, like mysterious thing that is like everywhere. But yeah. Mysterious. Mysterious is good. This week's episode was brought to you by the hard work of this shambling gray horde, and there are two tweets of the week this week. One from Lido Watts, who points us to some zombie scholarship on Jacobin Mag, and the second is from Twit Twit, who points us towards a call for papers about the relationship between Doctor Who and religion. We're not the only ones. Also, uh, some people have expressed an interest in hanging out and having conversations in a place other than the YouTube comment section, so we are gonna try an Idea Channel IRC. So we'll put some instructions for doing that in the description. Maybe I'll see you there.